Hey there, PMO superheroes. This is Emma from Wellington. Thanks for joining us for our Future PMO Academy Learning Week, the first ever. I'm really happy today to introduce this afternoon's speaker, Tim Jack. As always, feel free to get involved with the conversation. We would love it if you did. And you can use the questions panel on your GoToWebinar menu. We will be putting Tim on the spot a little bit later. <laughs> so for more than 20 years, Tim has been sharing and exploring his thoughts about change and continues to support the IPMA vision of enabling a world where all projects succeed as the global director for special interest groups. Today, Tim will be discussing how teams have developed over recent years and he's going to provide you with five strategies to help your PMO team for the future. So Tim, it's over to you. Thank you so much, Emma. Welcome, uh, everybody. I am really excited to be here. My name is Tim Jakes. Let me just show my screen here. There you go. Can you see that okay? Yep, that looks perfect. Terrific. Okay. So my name is Tim Jakes, and um, uh, this is super exciting because I think that the concept of teams and PMOs go together hand in hand. Um, PMOs are all about bringing people together um, and understanding the priorities, the, the, the processes, the, the things that are important to us now that we have to deliver. Um, and so I want to talk to you today about the five levers to move your project forward. Um, so that's the title of today's uh, discussion. I'll just tell you a little bit about me. I am a project manager and organizational change management guy. Um, I've, I've studied and focused a lot of my time on how teams perform. Um, I've written a, a couple of, co-authored a couple of books around project management and uh, team performance. Um, I'm a past board member of IPMA USA and have led or participated. I did a count, actually. Um, I went through and I estimate somewhere um, around 2,000 teams. So that was a rough count, but I think um, it's a lot of different teams, including everything from my high school sports to my um, to my, my teams that I've been on professionally and personally and everything. It's a lot of work. And I, to me, the, the, the key is that I don't think I'm, I'm such a standout. A lot of us have participated in our lives. We do our work in connection with other people. One of the things that I do is um, I work as in a volunteer capacity with the International Project Management Association. And for them, um, so, so I've been a prior board member for the USA chapter and now I'm working at the global level um, supporting the special interest groups uh, for ITMA. And so the special interest groups are, are really all about bringing people together under a bunch of different topical areas, mega projects and innovation uh, and artificial intelligence and smart cities, these kinds of different areas. And this has been really interesting for me because I get an opportunity to advance IPMA mission and goals across the, across the, the globe, if you will. Um, it's leading diverse teams that are global, that are volunteer based, which I think is always an interesting space to be in. Um, a lot of teams are, are volunteer oriented to some degree, even if they're at work. Um, and so that adds an additional component to it. Uh, I work with a wide range of people from industry experts, people who are uh, the, the, you know, they've done this for years and years and they're really well-known folks in their particular industry, all the way down to people who are just looking to get into project management. So all sorts of team dynamics are going on here in the special interest groups. And for more information, I would, advise you to go to ipma.world, ipma.world backslash sig and check that out. So that's a little bit about me, what we're gonna talk about today. And um, uh, Elena and Emma, I would just ask you if, if you're finding any, any good questions in the, in the questions panel, um, just feel free to interrupt me uh, as we go and we'll just um, take it from there. We're gonna have a discussion really in, in three parts here. A quick call to action, 
talk about these five levers, right? What are the things that, that you can do to um, make your teams, uh, to, to, to build more traction, to gain more clarity around what the teams are doing and how do we make them more relevant and more forward focused and all of that good stuff. Um, and then we'll just talk about how do we really push this forward? How do we lean into it in a way that gets you uh, and your team moving forward? So I wanna say this, this is not an all or nothing. And this is not uh, me coming at you from a place of, uh, um, as, as the know-it-all, this is really me um, saying, hey, take what you can from, from this presentation. If there's one or two things that stick out, then please grab those uh, and, and run with those. So that being said, um, Let's start with a call to action. So my my time uh, in working with teams, I, these are things that, um, these are areas for me that are of deep interest um, because I recognize that our world is getting more and more crowded, right? It's getting more competitive. Our world is getting more connected. Right? We have just an, an incredible amount of dialogue and it's a very loud, noisy world that we live in these days. And, and our world is getting more concerned. We, we have more and more focus on environment and sustainability. We have more and more people living on the earth. We have more and more um, uh, biz business models and, and approaches for doing work. And we've got uh, the craziness that is COVID and all kinds of things going on. So we live in a world that, of course, is amazingly and, and more and more complex. And this demands more from us as, as people who deal in teams. Um, you can sort of see on the screen right now, these are some of the solutions that I've worked in, probably that many of you work in. Um, so when we look at this, we can see, you know, everything from finance uh, and debt structure to logistics and governance, um, performance measurement and uh, efficiency, all these different areas are all solution areas that um, teams typically deal in. And that while each one of these areas may be very different from the next one, there are some commonalities that we as practitioners can bring to the experience of building and executing on a team. So the call to action is really around this. Our teams today in this hugely complex environment that we live and work in, we need to meet the moment. We need to understand that teams are the basic building blocks, that everything that we do today is, all of our work practically is in and around the team experience and professionals must become facile and effective in team building. We really need to become in a sense team ninjas, right? We have to understand how teams work and how, how they're functioning. Failure to understand the basics of team performance and correction um, jeopardizes this endeavor. So we are well beyond this concept of, I don't know how to operate a team or I've never been a team leader. We need to take our junior people and really put them into the driver's seat of, of managing teams and managing uh, change so that we can quickly um, adapt and, and meet the moment. So that's our challenge here. Let me talk then and dive into these sort of five levers. Um, and that's, you know, as the picture here uh, implies, there's five forward gears and one reverse gear, right? Um, and, you know, I think that it's important to note that uh, the reverse gear is there because frequently in a team setting, we'll, we need to back ourselves out a little bit. We need to take a step back and 
um, retrench, get ourselves out of a ditch, so to speak, to use that analogy, or or to just take a pause and look at where we are and move forward. So it's it isn't uh, you know it, it's an important analogy to understand that we are not always just going forward, but taking a pause is is an important part of a team. Our goal. Typically, every team is different, but I think some of the more common goals are building teams that are fit to purpose, that are high functioning and resilient, that drive complex solutioning. Um, this is maybe one of the biggest areas that I have seen teams uh, underperform at. Uh, that is that teams will typically go with the lowest common denominator of solution rather than really diving in to the complexities and the nuances of what the solution should look like. Um, and some, it's, that behavior is driven by a number of different factors that we'll get into, but we need our teams to be driving complex solutions and, and creating compelling experiences that, compel, that propel careers forward. So what does that mean? Well, when you think about the best teams that you've ever been on, or the best work experiences maybe that you've ever had, typically, A, these are on teams, and B, the, it's because of that it was an exceptional team experience, right? Um, so I think what's important for us as team leaders and team participants is to recognize that this is something important for us to be able to um, strive towards. So that being said, here are the five levers, all right? Five levers are trust, building trust, um, creating a sense, a deep sense of purpose, resilience, cognitive diversity, conflict and cohesion. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about this. Um, this is imbued with, of course, my opinion, my thoughts about each of these areas, but also there's some research that I'll cite that's, that goes into each one of these areas. Uh, and in fact, there's a lot of research that goes into each one of these areas. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to sort of talk through some of that with you. So the first concept um, and maybe almost universally um, among researchers, one of the first concepts usually is this idea of trust. And so when we talk about trust, one of the first areas that we, that we come to is vulnerability, right? And there's really three ingredients that, that pull trust forward. The first one is vulnerability. The second one is mutual dependability. And the third, is consistency, all right? So the idea is, and let me start with those bottom two first, mutual dependability. That means that I am relying on you to get things done and you are relying on me to get things done. If we don't have to rely on each other, it, there's actually a degradation in the level of trust that that we have, right? Because we don't have that that interlocking relationship. Second component in trust is consistency. So I deliver. I deliver when I say I'm gonna deliver, and so do you, right? So we have this sort of mutual dependability and consistency, and the third element in trust is really the, the, um, the uh, well, you know, if you think of this as head, heart, and hands, right? So the vulnerability is truly the heart of it. Vulnerability uh, is that I am willing to open up and share myself in this process and be vulnerable to uh, whether it's in a very professional setting and I am on the line as much as you are for a deliverable or in a more personal way that I can open up as a human in this, in this group setting. The idea is that when we are engaging in trust, that we have these three ingredients that are that are building around it. Now this is countenanced by uh, maybe some of you have seen this model before. So Bruce Tuckman um, uh, 
created the forming, storming, norming, and performing model back in the uh, back in you know it was published in 1965. So he had been working on it for quite a while, um, and this model of forming, storming, norming, and performing then got amended in the 70s uh, to add adjourning to it. But the idea is that team effectiveness starts higher um, and, and degrades as the storming phase happens, and then the, the norming phase brings it back up, and then finally the team can actually find a higher level of performance. Um, and the, the concept here is that is that every team goes through this, and there's a lot of different ways to look at this, but the, con the, the, the idea being that you have to sort of go through that curve. Um, and it, in fact, even if you add new team members or take away team members, the existing team has to reset itself around our roles and the, 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 the types of um, archetypal energies that we are inhabiting for that team. And so there may be additional cycles of forming and storming and norming as the team sets and resets. And we know that teams are very dynamic places. And so this happens quite a bit. So part of our job as team leaders, as, as people who are um, working in teams is to be able to work through this model frequently to, to recognize where we are in it and then to move through it uh, more completely. So how does that look? Well, let's take a look at this. So you can see across this table, forming, storming, norming, and performing. I left a journey off of this, oops. So in the forming stage, you can see here that the focus is on orientation. There's a high dependence on the leader. When a group is just getting together, we wanna make sure that the leader is really the one, it's a very, it can be a very transactional relationship, right? So the leader has to be directive, giving specific assignments to people, sorting out the roles very directly, understanding who is doing what and by when. All of those things tend to happen in the forming stage um, in a very directive fashion. In the, in the storming stage then, the focus becomes more about clarifying those roles, all right? The team behavior shifts from depending on a leader to now we're interacting with each other for the first time and there's conflict. And that conflict um, can be healthy or unhealthy, um, but it's a natural thing. It, it will happen naturally. It's not a, it, it doesn't indicate that the team is doing anything wrong. What it indicates is that we're pulling back the layer of the onion and now seeing what's really there and trying to sort through who's, who's taking which roles, who's doing which work, all of those things. And so the leader role there then becomes more around coaching and mediating, all right? Norming happens eventually. And what we try to do in using this model is to shorten the phase of storming. We try to keep this as short as possible. If it extends on too long, it gets uh, it can it can lower the the overall productivity of the team in a long term way. So we try to move through through storming into the norming phase. And here the focus really is on communication. Um, we look at um, the team behavior shifts from conflict to cooperation. And then finally, the leader role is to facilitate. So now we go from a directive role, very transactional, to coaching and mediating through the storming phase. And finally, we're at this place where we're facilitating, right? We're, we're helping each of the team members uh, do the things that they need to do. And there's a level of cooperation. And finally, in the forming stage, I'm sorry, in the performing stage, the focus is on productivity. How do we excel? How do we, now we all know each other and we know our foibles and we know our strengths. How do we really move this forward? And the team behavior then becomes one of interdependence. We've got each other's back and we, we know that things are gonna flow between us. And so the trust become, becomes really high here um, to get to a performing stage. And the leader role then is more around delegation, making sure that each of the team members 
uh, understands what they need to produce and by when, and otherwise it can be very hands-off uh, for a lot of teams. So this is really an interesting model, I think, because uh, forming, storming, norming, and performing is a, is a model that's been around. Many of us know this for, for decades it's been around. Um, when you think about it from the context of trust, however, um, it kind of opens it up to us that now we can see how actually these stages of group behavior can be a, a vehicle or a driver of team trust, that we have to go through this. And what we really want to do is to make sure that, that the team is moving through this because it's the act of doing this that is that builds trust. Hey Tim, this is yeah. Emma. Just a quick question on that model um, around. So, from a leadership perspective, obviously we've got you know going from directing to coaching and meditating, at mediating to facilitating and delegating. What tactics would you say people need to think about to be able to switch their style? Because like directing to coaching and, and mediating is a very different set of skills. Um, yeah. So how do we switch from one to the other? Oh, that's great. So one of the things, um, thank you for the question. I, I think one of the things that uh, as a team leader that, that um, we can embrace is the concept of pivoting. Um, and so um, what, what I could offer up is this, is that when we are, first, first thing that we can do is to recognize where do I think we are? And it's not, it's oftentimes not very clear. There may be some conflict, even though we're mostly in a cooperative state. So we're going from storming into norming. Um, and, you know, teams are oftentimes driven by conflict throughout their entire existence. So it's not to say that conflict goes away, but it's not the dominant behavior. So the practical toolkit that a leader can really rely on um, is, uh, so in, in a directive state, is to have strong agendas, is to call, have regular team meetings and have more frequent team meetings in the forming stage. Right to spend a lot of time getting into the process, um, understanding specific timelines, deliverables, et cetera. When we move into the conflict mode and, and the leader role is really coaching and mediating there, um, to me, the, the behavior then becomes more about um, understanding, asking questions, um, understanding viewpoints of the different members. So you go from really driving the, the meeting agendas and whatnot into more of a space of let's understand your, your different perspectives and doing uh, conflict management kind of um, skill sets, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Norming then um, the, in the facilitate um, uh, phase, in the norming phase, when we are facilitating, I think what we're doing is we're finding areas of commonality. So we're really trying to bring and connect, bring together and connect the different outputs, the different workflows, the things that are, are, are really working. And then finally in delegating, I think that the skill set there is really around um, building the capability um, and recognizing people. So you know, there you know the the team meetings in a in a high performance team look very different from forming. Right, we're celebrating a lot of wins in the performing stage. Um, you know, there's there's much more. Um, uh, I think that there is much more. Uh, the the conversation shifts much more to how do we take the outputs from one person and and use them, maximize them um, across the team. Those kinds of things. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Great question. So, you know, we, we can use the, the tried and true Tuckman model of forming, storming, norming, performing to build mutual dependent, dependability, consistency, and vulnerability, which really is the thing that, that forms the core of trust. And when we have this trust, what it really is saying to the members of the team is our team is a safe place. We can operate. You can be you. You can operate well here. 
Um, doesn't mean we don't have conflict, doesn't mean we don't, we aren't challenged, we aren't pushing to the edge, all, it just means that we have a safe, this is a safe place for you to operate. And we put ourselves on the line, right? So trust doesn't mean that we're safe and we're warm and we're all snuggled in a blanket. It means we're out there, we're doing things, but we've got each other. So, Let's talk about a study that occurred. Um, now the, the study has, has concluded mostly um, and, and it's called Project Aristotle. It happened at Google. And, and I wanna just point out, there's a lot to it, um, but if you, if you Google <laughs> Project Aristotle, um, you'll, you'll see um, some interesting things that, that went on at Google. What they did was a five-year project to understand you know, there's thousands of teams in Google and what makes a team tick? What are the drivers of success at a team? Um, and so they published this at their site, Rework. Um, and so here are the big areas that work. And, and, and these are the five things that mattered more that make effective teams. So the first one was psychological safety, right? And, and this is a little bit of what, what um, that triangle looks like. So psychological safety, team members feel safe to take risks and be vulnerable in front of each other. The second factor is dependability. They get things done. Third is structure and clarity. Team members have clear roles, plans, and goals. Fourth factor is that there is meaning. The work is personally important to team members. And the fifth is the impact. Team members think their work matters and creates change. So these are the things that mattered more on teams, uh, on the high-performing teams at Google. Now, here's what mattered less. Co-location. Consensus-driven decision-making. That was not as important. Extraversion of the team members. You know, Google, as you can imagine, is a, is a huge mix of cultures. Um, I've been to the, to the Google headquarters in, in uh, Ireland. and you know, I think in, in places like that, as well as in, in uh, California, what you can see is a huge melting pot of cultures and languages and levels of extroversion and cultural differences and all these things. So the level of extroversion is less important um, for team performance. Individual team performance of team members is less important according to this study, workload size, seniority, team size, and tenure. So all of these things tended to matter less on, on the team, according to this uh, Project Aristotle study. So I'll talk a little bit more about team size in a few minutes, um, but I thought that this would be interesting to look at, and that's, an, that's a good resource for you to go to um, if you're interested is, you know, go to the rework site and just check out all the things that they're doing, but in particular Project Aristotle, um, there's some good guidance there. So the first lever that we've talked about is building a, an environment of trust for your team. The second then is to orient your team to a higher calling. All right, and there's really three three areas here to look at. The first one is the purpose. So for, for a team to really um, move forward, they need a stated compelling vision that is impactful for the team, organization, industry, and even for the planet. So we need to have that sort of higher calling. And it doesn't mean that everybody on the team all the time operates uh, with, uh, a, a higher purpose. It doesn't mean that. And there are a lot of people out there who are much more focused on day to day. I just want to know what I have to get done. Um, but that being said, there is this idea that we are aspirational creatures that we, you know, if, if our only job is to just build the next slide deck or build the next deliverable or, you know, whatever, doesn't, you know, or even the next product, um, for a lot of people, that's not enough. So having that compelling vision is important. And then along with that, having your outcomes and key results that are 
important, right? We need to have from that purpose then specific goals and key results. And as well, we wanna have um, an approach that works for the team. And I, this is a little bit of my bias. I like to have minimal process, you know, just enough to make it work, rock solid regular check-ins, you know, and uh, a conflict management approach. How do we, how do we uh, de-escalate and how do we escalate uh, issues and risks and, and those kinds of things? So when we orient to this higher calling, it's really about locking in these three elements, the purpose, the goals, and the approach. And just getting these things kind of stated. I will say this, my experience is, I rarely get it right the first time. Um, and that's okay, teams are dynamic and we have to be able to move, um, move through a process that, you know, where we're refining over time. So our purpose statement doesn't have to be the world's greatest, but this is something that you can do today on your team to make it work. When we do all of that, really the message to the team is we are focused. Right. We, what we've done is we've eliminated something that's very important to from an adult learning perspective, which is the why. Why are we doing this? So we've established trust. And now we've answered that really critical question, which is why and also why now? Through writing out the purpose, the goals and the approach, we have a focus now that we can rely on and move forward. So along with that, I wanna tell you a little bit about some of the research that's happened that, that actually small teams, which many of us operate on around the world, um, small teams get a lot of stuff done. So research has identified that smaller teams experience better work-life quality. And these are our studies that are referenced. Engage in more organizational citizenship behaviors, right? So we are more accountable and therefore we are, have a higher level of citizenship orientation. Um, smaller teams can be more beneficial for team success than larger teams, all right? So there's studies around that that show that um, have better work outcomes, have less conflict, stronger communication, more cohesion. So small teams uh, can be a real gift of fewer than 10 people, can be a real gift to um, those of us who work in those kinds of teams um, because we can get a lot done. So I would encourage you, if you are on, on teams or if you're you know part of a team and you have the, an ability to kind of um, influence the size of it, Going for a smaller team works. For project managers in particular, um, my strategy here is oftentimes in a project setting to create a core team and to create a customer team and to create a product team. So these small, rather than having like a project team of 30 people, I might have uh, three or four different teams that are smaller in size that, that tackle specific uh, challenges. Um, and that's been a strategy that's worked very well for me. All right. I love this third lever. This is something that I try to bring into each one of my areas, each one of my teams. So the idea behind cultivating resilience is this. Resilience is a is a place that's a, is a state of being, right? And we don't always have it. To me, it's a, it's, um, you know, it's a little bit like being in shape, right? Like you're in shape today, maybe you've been working out for three weeks, but if you take a week off, you're gonna be less in shape, right? And so this concept of resilience is like that. We have to practice at it. We have to um, help, you know, support, the, the concept of resilience in our team. And why do we do that? Well, our teams are frequently in a state of flux, right? Always there's maybe somebody leaving, somebody coming on, there may be 
Um, there may be uh, high workload, high volume kinds of things. There could be um, other teams that are doing work similar to ours, and so that's a bit of a threat to what we're doing. Um, so resilience is a quality that thrives in those in-between states. That's the area that carries us through. And it's different than, say, trust. Like, we can trust in our team but have low resilience, so we sort of fall apart when there's a challenge. Resilience really is the thing that, that um, enables us to move forward. So what is resilience? Well, let me just offer this up, and I, I, um, I'm not too keen on giving this as direction so much as, you know, just check in with yourself on, on a team maybe that you're on. What does this look like? So the research suggests that team resilience comprises five different concepts. First one is well-being. We prioritize the well-being of our team members when we're resilient. So if somebody's sick um, or if somebody is, needs a mental health day or if there's too much work going on for a person, we prioritize that problem uh, or that issue. That the teams are actively engaged, right? So we are actively engaged with each other in those challenges. That's a sign of team resilience and it's, it's something that drives our, our increase of resilience. That there is this concept of a prototyping mindset. So we are willing to try we're willing to try smaller things. We're willing to force um, uh, something along and to, to, to um, try it as a pilot or as a prototype, um, that we have a feedback giving culture. So in, in a resilient team, we, we give each other feedback and we have that ability to course correct. And finally is mentoring and learning. So the idea that we can actually learn from each other, um, that new members, when they come on, there's a mentoring process, um, that we are teaching each other. So there's this element of humility and curiosity in a resilient team. Resilient teams tend to be low ego. They tend to be not driven by one grand personality that, that drives everything forward, but rather they tend to be teams that are very uh, in sync and, and uh, by individuals who are willing to um, examine themselves and take a step back as needed, et cetera. So these five elements collectively, um, the research shows that these are, are things that support the idea of resilience. And when we have resilience, where we, what we're really saying is our team can take it. Give us your best shot because we can take it, right? We can do the work. We can uh, go through that rough patch. Um, resilience is super important for teams to understand what it is that they um, that they have that they don't have. The the coming at the problem honestly, seeing things as they are. So. We want to cultivate relationship, and in fact, there's been some studies around it. Um, one in particular was done through uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT Human Dynamics Lab, and they, I, they did a very interesting study at MIT. So they actually put badges on people. Uh, so over 2,500 people in 21 organizations, everybody wore a necklace with a badge, and these badges then um, actually were recording devices. And what they did was they recorded um, their proximity to the other badges, all right? And so based on the data that came from this study and observational data as well, here are sort of the, the five different um, uh, characteristics that came out of this that define successful teams. Number one is everyone on the team talks and listens about the same amount of time as others, and their contributions are relatively short and to the point. So you don't have people dominating the conversation. Members face each other while engaging in conversations. Um, that can be characterized as energetic. So when there was conflict, let's say, people actually were facing each other 
it's interesting. There is a there's a, a, a psychologist here in the United States who um, has made very accurate predictions about uh, about the length of time that certain uh, married couples would be married, and he cites the reason for his predictions. The way that he can tell how long a couple will actually be married is by watching them fight. Believe it or not, how a couple handles conflict determines how well they perform as a couple going forward. So this along with that, that was completely separate, but it sort of um, goes along with this study that happened at, at the Human Dynamics Lab. That is when engaging in conversations that can be characterized as energetic, members were facing each other. Very interesting. Members cannot, I'm sorry, members connect directly with everyone in the group and not just with the team leader. So there's a lot of um, uh, so connections across and between and throughout the, the various team members. Team members carry on back channel or side conversations within the team. So there's a lot of conversations that are not part of the official dialogue, just in the team meetings themselves, but they actually happen outside. And then finally, members occasionally explore outside the team and bring information back. So we're not completely insular. So that's the idea. With this study, I, I, the thing I, I, I really love to pull from this is that um, these are really like indicators of successful teams, right? Do we talk and listen about the same amount of time? Do we face each other? Are we physically in proximity uh, when we're having high energy conversations uh, such as conflict? Uh, do we connect with everyone? Do you see your team members connecting with everyone or are there smaller groups that tend to stick together? Um, uh, are there back channel and side conversations within the team? And are you finding external information? So interesting study from MIT. So let's keep going. Lever number four is this idea of cognitive diversity. Well, what is cognitive diversity? So cognitive diversity is this idea that we need both critical and creative thinking to solve our modern complex challenges, right? So we've got, we've got some of the most complicated solutions that need to be created today. I mean, you think about the, the trash patch in the Pacific, right? It's a, it's a patch of garbage that's as, as large as the UK. And, um, and it's got big pieces and small pieces and microscopic pieces, and it's polluting the planet. And all the trash that floats around in the Pacific tends, to, or a lot of it tends to converge in this one area in the northern part of the Pacific. And, and you know, so that's an example. That's a hugely complex problem. If we only had high critical thinkers, if we had high critical and low creative thinkers dealing with that, um, we might not get to the right solution, right? We might see everything from the point of view of how do we get better data? How do we come up with a better engineering solution? If we only use the creative thinkers, we may not get to the right data because we'd come up with the world's best, you know, trash picker upper boat, but it might be completely impractical to build because we don't have the right engineering minds on it. And so really what we want to do is get into this sort of area, pardon me, get into this area that's in the upper right quadrant, that is high critical and high creative thinking. And, and But as well, have high criticals and have high creatives as well. We really want to try to focus on those areas. What does that get us? Well, take a look at this. When we have high critical thinkers, we have operate, we get people who are focused on operational efficiency. I call these hero tasks, right? These are the folks who do high operational efficiency, increased capacity, continuous improvement. What's the path to failure? How, do, how will this thing break? How do we make it work? Let's break it down, let's deconstruct it, right? 
On the other side, down on the lower right-hand side, the high creative but low critical thinkers, you see those people, their hero tasks are all around. What's the possibility here? How do we, how do we build something crazy? What's the competitive advantage that we can get from this? Um, let's come up with a whole lot of ideas. You know, more ideas might make it happen. Um, how do we make it appealing for people? How do we engage others in this process? And how do we ignite change, right? So this, there's this sort of tension you can see between high critical and high creative. And then you do have, uh, there is a, a group of people, um, uh, and by the way, this work that I'm citing here is all cited from um, from a, a good friend of mine, Susan Reed, um, from a company called Edge Dweller that does incredible work around innovation. Um, and all of these things are measurable, actually, um, as it turns out, your level of creativity and critical thinking. Um, but thinking about sort of the high critical and high creative, you get the sort of um, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates types of people out there who look for industry disruption, who look for business model innovation, continuous innovation, path to the future, right? So where, where a critical thinker might say, well, a critical thinker might say, this is how this thing will break. And that's of utmost importance because you need to know that. The, the high critical and creative will say, well, this is how we get to the future. This is how we build this thing. Maybe we're building it stepwise, right? And how do we make it possible? How do we construct it? How do we get it there? So, so the idea is we need all of these different types to get to a place of cognitive diversity. So I invite you to look at your teams and think through what are the skills that are there? How creative are your teams? How creative are your solution, solutions? How, uh, how is the critical thinking? And to begin to build around that because we need that. And what this really says is our team adopts and pivots when we have all these different skills. Now, one of the common problems I see on a team um, speaks to this concept of conflict. And this is the what's in economics is called the free rider problem, all right? So the free rider problem is interesting. Free riders are individuals who accrue the benefits of the team without contributing to the success. Maybe you know some of these people, right? They are the smart, lazy people in the world. <laughs> so this work comes from Adam Grant from his book, Originals. So the free rider problem is interesting because um, free riders are people who, who get to take the benefit of a team, right? Maybe they're social people and they like to hang out with others. Maybe they want to have the professional accolades of having been associated with that team but they don't want to actually do the work. Maybe you know some of these people. Maybe you are one of those people. So what I want to suggest to you is that this is a learned behavior, right? People learn how to become free riders and some people get to be very good at it. Um, as a team leader, what we need to do is to work, is to recognize the free riders, and then to deal with that. And it's through this, right? It's stuff that we all know, we all know, and we can probably answer this ourselves without the list, but it's clear expectations of work, accountability, creating visibility into people's work. That's one of the best ways to solve the free rider problem is just shine some sunlight onto what they're doing and make sure everyone can see it. And, um, and that will, uh, quickly solve it for most of us. Um, Self-assessment, conflict resolution. So these are the areas that I think um, we can begin to bring to it. If we have individuals or even groups of individuals who um, don't pull their weight. So I offer this up as kind of a, a precursor to the last, to the final lever, lever number five. 
embracing conflict and building cohesion. So conflict and cohesion, they're like two sides of the same coin. Just as we have to go forming and then storming and then norming and performing, we have to recognize that conflict is part of the game. And in fact, many teams thrive in that tension. That tension is utterly important. There's an interesting study that was done that's not cited here uh, that was done around the level of extroversion of salespeople in car buying situations. And what was interesting about this is that the car salesmen who were very highly extroverted actually sold less than the car salesmen who were only moderately extroverted. So we want, right? So in other words, like they sold about the, the highly extroverted and the very low extroversion uh, sale, car salesmen both sold about the same, right? And it was because the people who were highly extroverted were sort of in your face trying to sell you a car. It was the people who were just a little bit on the overly aggressive side uh, or more aggressive side um, of extroverted, those were the people who had the highest sales performance. So we have to recognize that this idea of conflict is really inherent and part of a team, um, and we should seek opportunities for productive conflict. Actually, my approach, in, when I'm in the forming stage of a team, I really look for those areas where I can spot con potential conflict and try to get the team to that point because it's it's um it you know going through that initial rush of conflict is a bit like going through rapids if you're in a canoe or a kayak where you really just have to sort of paddle faster than the current it's gonna happen there's nothing you can do to stop it so what you're really trying to do is to just try to move through it in a way that can be beneficial that we're not uh crashing on the rocks to use that analogy so we seek opportunities. So we can use tools like Thomas Kilman to help navigate it, um, you know, and, and to help the teams recognize that conflict is there. And the cohesion then is born out of that, that our ability to kind of come together afterwards is part of that uh, process of, of doing that, of, of going through the conflict. So three key tensions of high performance teams. This was a study that was done by a, a private consultancy of senior level teams. So if any of you are, are part of a, of a vice presidential or above team um, and you work with that team on an ongoing basis, there, uh, this study really dealt with that. So, you know, what were the different kinds of disagreements that happened? Um, and how do these, how do the higher performing teams uh, thrive? So the three areas that that tend to come up the most are number one, risk versus results. So, so the idea of do we shy away from risk or do we embrace risk? That that's a, a really key concept for a team to handle. How do we look at risk and results that come from that risk? Um, Second one is external versus internal pull. So teams that scan the external factors and minimize internal politics tend to outperform those teams that don't do that. So part of our job as leaders and as key contributors to teams, we have to um, do those scans. We have to look out into the environment and look across our organization and recognize that. And then finally, the top down and bottom up. The teams that drive a culture of innovation versus teams that give directives um, uh, tend to outperform. So we want to have a team that is in that high performance state of delegation, of informing, of coaching and, and working with teams that way. So these three sort of polarities tend to work well, risk versus results, external versus internal, top down versus bottoms up. And what we wanna do is to um, get comfortable with those places where tensions occur 
we w- tensions, uh, you know, the conflict and tensions are really patterns. And um, the more that we can uh, see them, get comfortable, recognize them, and and see the polarities that exist there, um, it's very very helpful for us to know um, that we can resolve these things, that we can find a common ground and move it forward. What that really does, what when we when we are honest about our conflict and honest about the level of cohesion that it brings, we get to this place for our team that is our work is a discovery of truth we are unfettered by conflict we are all about the discovery of truth and that's a very powerful thing for a team to get to um when when we know that we're in pursuit of something bigger um and so these conflicts are really just the pathway there okay So let me just take a quick minute here and just talk about what it means to sort of lean in on these, right? So we have these five levers and what I wanna invite you to do is to um, think about what does this mean to continuously build trust, right? It's trust is a finite thing perhaps, trust is a thing that gets built over time Trust is something that's dynamic as new people come in. The other thing about trust that's interesting is that it is, um, you know, my son who is 17 just started driving. Now I trust him to drive a car around town. Um, I wouldn't trust him to drive a car across the country yet um, or to drive overnight, let's say, or to drive with a a big group of his friends to the beach. Um, He's just learning. So I have trust in one context, but not in another. So that's the idea behind continuously building trust is doesn't mean handing over everything. It means that we are, um, we're building, we're, we're growing that trust through, through leveraging those three ingredients, finding and refining our purpose. And I think that, that that goes along with the conflict and cohesion that we are really always in, a, in this process of Um, discovery and refinement of our purpose, practicing resilience, discovering and deploying cognitive diversity. Um, Many of us get given our teams. We don't have a lot of say in who is on our team. Um, I will just say this to you who are in that position. You can make a difference. You can change your your outlook and and make changes to your team as as needed. Um, and to do that, it, it may take time, but build, make a case for it. Make a case for having a different team. Make a case that you're not trying to do anybody wrong. You're just trying to go for something that's, that's as powerful as possible. So make a positive case for that and continue to push forward. It can happen. And seek out productive conflict and cohesion. This is of all of the factors of team performance that I've come across, those teams that really are comfortable and actually look for productive conflict and cohesion, um, those are the teams that always, always outperform other teams because there is a level of truth and honesty there that, um, that doesn't exist in other teams. So I would ask you right now to just simply write down, you know that that was a bit of a whirlwind. I love giving more content than you can possibly handle um, in an hour, but I want you to sort of think on this and consider what is one thing that you could take away that you could apply to your teams today. And so with that, I just want to say thank you. This has been a, a, a quick hit on that. There's my information. Please reach out to me. Search me out on LinkedIn. Um, so Elena and Emma, I don't know if there are any last-minute questions. We have about a minute left, but please, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, thank you, Tim. That was really insightful. Uh, I really enjoyed it, and I'm sure it provided some real tactical strategies that PMO teams can take away. We do have some questions, but conscious of time. So what we're going to do is send them over to you. And then if you do a written answer, what we'll do is we'll attach it to the the event uh, for people to be able to see. So you've got the time to express yourself. 
The one thing I do want to ask you, uh, our theme for our conference this year was superheroes. So if you could go back in time and give yourself some advice before you started on your project management and PMO journey, what would it be, Tim? Yeah, great question. I think what I would say is to um, spend more time, um, uh, to, to spend more time listening. I think I would, you know, I, I think I've, I, and I say that now after having spoken for the last hour, but to me, I think the the best project management heroes, the best project management mentors I have come across have all been great active listeners. They've been people who, um, a, and and consequently ask the right questions. So, to me, that's that's a a sign of somebody who um, who is curious, who is humble who um, wants to adapt, all of those great qualities that I think we look for in project managers. Amazing. Thank you, Tim. It's been an honor to have you. And thank you to all our listeners for joining us today. We hope to see you at our next Future PMO Academy Learning event brought to you by Wellington. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.